Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to go through a practice problem that demonstrates how to find the optimal consumption bundle when we have perfect substitutes. And I can actually think of three ways to solve questions like this. So it's a long video because I go through all three strategies. If you're in a rush, I'll put a note in the description which parts could make up a shorter version and the contents which list those parts is in the description as well. All right, here's our question. Monica's utility over crayons C and pencils P is given by the utility function U is equal to 2C plus 8P. The price of pencils, that's P subscript P, is $2 and the price of crayons, that's P subscript C, is $4. Monica's income is $800. What is Monica's optimal bundle of consumption of crayons and pencils? Now, the thing is, when we have perfect substitutes, there are only really three possible ways that things could go. So I'm going to draw three diagrams to illustrate. As you can see, I've put crayons on the horizontal axes and pencils on the vertical axes. Our indifference curves, when we have perfect substitutes, and I'll just label them IC, they're going to be linear. So straight lines, maybe something like this. And just for this demonstration, I'll fill in four indifference curves per diagram. Of course, conceptually, there are lots and lots of indifference curves here. The whole space is filled up, but I'll just draw four to illustrate for our purposes and I'll label them one to four. Now, the three cases that we can get correspond to the ways that our budget constraint can lie relative to our indifference curves. So our budget constraint will also be linear. It'll also be a straight line and I'll draw it in black. So case number one is where our budget constraint is steeper than our indifference curves. So something like this. Case number two will be where our budget constraint is flatter than our indifference curves. So something like this. And case number three is where our budget constraint has exactly the same slope as our indifference curves. So maybe something like this. Now in case one, what I hope you can see is that the highest indifference curve that we can get to with our budget constraint is IC4, indifference curve four. And the bundle associated with that is right where our budget constraint and our indifference curve, where they meet at the axis. So I'll put a red dot there. And here our consumer is only consuming pencils. Remember the goal is to try and get to the highest indifference curve given our budget constraint. Now this is what we call a corner solution, which is where our consumer spends all of their income on just one of the goods and they consume none of the other good. And this generalizes. If we have cases like case number one, where our budget constraint is steeper than our indifference curve, then our consumer's optimal bundle will be a corner solution where they only consume the good on the vertical axes and none of the good on the horizontal axes. In case number two, we have the opposite sort of situation. We still have a corner solution, but I hope you can see that the highest indifference curve that I can get to given my budget constraint will be IC3. And at that point where our budget constraint meets that indifference curve, our consumers are only consuming crayons. So it's another corner solution. And so in general, if we have cases like case number two, where our budget constraint is flatter than our indifference curves, then our consumer's optimal bundle will be a corner solution where they only consume the good on the horizontal axes and none of the good on the vertical axes. Now the third case will be when our indifference curves have exactly the same slope as our budget constraint, so something like this. Now because conceptually all of our bundles are ranked, there will be an indifference curve that occupies exactly the same line as our budget line. So I'll just put a dotted line here to indicate that there is an indifference curve here. Both lines are in the same place. Now in this case, our consumer will be indifferent between consuming all pencils or all crayons or some mixture in between. So any bundle along the budget line will be optimal, that's case three. And again, that result generalizes if your budget constraint has the same slope as your indifference curves, then the consumer is indifferent between the good on the horizontal axes and the good on the vertical axes or any combination in between. 
Now, seeing these three possible outcomes informs us of the strategies that we can use to solve our problem. The first way will be to evaluate our consumer's utility at the corner solutions. So we check if our consumer spends all their money on crayons or if they spend all their money on pencils. If consuming pencils gives us a higher utility, then we know we're on a hiring difference curve. So we have case one. Or if consuming only crayons gives us a higher level of utility, then we're on a hiring difference curve in that case, in which case we have a case like case two. If the corner solutions give exactly the same level of utility, then we know we have the third kind of case, we're on the same indifference curve no matter what we do. The second approach is going to be to compare our slopes of our budget constraint with our slope of our indifference curves. And this will tell us whether we have case one or case two, or if they have the same slope, we have case three. And this approach, I have to say, has a nice economic interpretation if you want a deeper understanding of what's going on. The third way is to compare our marginal utility per dollar spent on each good. In the case of perfect substitutes, because our indifference curves are straight lines, the marginal utility per dollar for each good is constant. So if we calculate this, we either will have one good that gives a higher marginal utility per dollar, in which case we have a corner solution. If the marginal utility per dollar is equal over both goods, then we have the third case. And this third strategy is really an application of the equimarginal principle, which is one way that we characterize interior solutions, if you're familiar with that. All right, let's think about strategy number one with our question. We're going to evaluate Monica's level of utility at the possible corner solutions to see which bundle, if either, puts us on a higher indifference curve. So I have our three outcomes illustrated here. Either all pencils or all crayons put us on the higher indifference curve, or they will give the same level of utility, so they'll be on the same indifference curve. Now, to do this, we're first going to have to figure out how much of each good Monica can afford if she only buys that good. So if Monica spends all of her income on crayons, how many crayons will she consume? Well, we take Monica's total income, I'll call it M, and divide it by the price of crayons. So 800 divided by four, is equal to 200. So if Monica spends all of her income on crayons, she would purchase 200 of them. We can then substitute that number into Monica's utility function. We would get, so utility is equal to, well, two times the number of crayons, which is 200, plus eight times. Well, we're not consuming any pencils at this corner solution, so the number of pencils will be zero. So that's equal to 400 in total. All right, well, if Monica spent all of her income on pencils instead, she would purchase, well, we take her total income, then divide it by the price of pencils. So that's 800 over two, which is 400. We can substitute that into Monica's utility function. So utility is equal to, well, two times zero, because we're not consuming any crayons, plus eight times, well, we're, we're consuming 400 pencils at that point. So that's all equal to 3,200. So we can see that Monica gets a higher level of utility when she consumes only pencils. So we have a situation like the first case, that's a corner solution, where Monica consumes zero crayons and 400 pencils. So that's our answer. We can think about strategy number two though, we're going to compare the slope of Monica's budget constraint with the slope of her indifference curve. Now we have the three cases down here again. From our previous strategy, we really expect the first case, that the slope of the budget constraint will be steeper than the slope of Monica's indifference curves. Now the slope of the budget constraint will be the negative of the ratio of prices, so the negative of the price of crayons over the price of pencils. So from our question, the price of crayons is four and the price of pencils is two, so negative two. Now, the slope of our budget constraint actually represents the rate which our consumers can trade pencils for one crayon in the market. So this tells us that we can trade two pencils for one crayon in the market. And this makes sense given our prices. A crayon is $4 and one pencil is $2. So I can get two pencils for one crayon. Now, I do have a video on budget constraints which goes through all of this in more detail, so I'll link to that in the description if you need more explanation around this. The slope of our indifference curve, on the other hand, can be found. Well, there is a few ways we can do it in this case, but I can take the negative of our MRS, our marginal rate of substitution, so that's the negative of our marginal utility of crayons, 
divided by the marginal utility of pencils. I do have a video on our MRS and the slope of our indifference curves as well. So I'll link to that below if you need more explanation on, on this stuff. The marginal utility of crayons will just be equal to the partial derivative of the utility function with respect to crayons. So it's equal to, we're treating pencils like a constant and we take the derivative that's equal to, well, it comes out just as two. And the marginal utility of pencils is the partial derivative of the utility function with respect to pencils. So in this case, we're going to treat crayons as a constant. So taking the partial derivative, we just get eight. So the slope then is equal to negative two over eight. So negative one quarter. And you'll notice here that our marginal utility of crayons and pencils are constant. So it doesn't change. And that is characteristic of perfect substitutes. So the slope of our indifference curves then is negative a quarter and the slope of our budget constraint is negative two. So we've confirmed what we saw using our first strategy that we have a situation like the first case where the slope of our budget constraint is steeper than the slope of our indifference curves. So that leads us to our corner solution. And as we saw before, at this point, Monica consumes 400 pencils and no crayons. Now, here's for the interesting bit, the economic interpretation of our MRS or the slope of our indifference curve is that it tells us how many pencils Monica will trade for one crayon, which holds her level of utility constant. So we see that the slope is equal to negative a quarter. This means that Monica is willing to trade a quarter of a pencil for one crayon. She only needs a quarter of a pencil to give her as much utility as one crayon. So in terms of our economic interpretation of what's happening, why Monica is driven to a corner solution, we can see from the slope of our budget constraint that if Monica has one crayon, she can trade that crayon for two pencils in the market. But we see from the slope of the indifference curve that Monica really values one crayon equal to only a quarter of a pencil. So it makes sense that Monica would never hold any crayons because if she ever had any crayons, she could trade each crayon in the market for two pencils, which is a great deal for her, given that she values each crayon only equivalent to a quarter of a pencil. So the corner solution of her only consuming pencils and not holding any crayons makes a lot of sense. All right, let's think about the third approach. This approach really comes from the principle that if we're weighing up between spending some money on two goods, the optimal approach is to spend the next marginal dollar on the good that gives you the biggest bang for your buck. So the greatest marginal utility per dollar spent. So just to connect this to other stuff you might have learned, this way of thinking underlies what is called the equimarginal principle. So abstractly, if we think of two goods, X and Y, then at an interior optimum, if we are consuming positive amounts of both goods, the marginal utility of X divided by the price of X. So that's the additional utility per dollar from consuming X is equal to the marginal utility of Y over the price of Y, which is the additional utility per dollar from consuming Y. And so this is one way that we think about the interior optimum when we have Cobb-Douglas utility functions, for instance. For us, this equality will be true at the optimum if we have our third case here. And that's what really underlies the indifference between crayons and, and pencils that we get in this case. If we have a corner solution, then it will be the case that the marginal utility per dollar for one of the goods will be larger than the other. So let's check the marginal utility of crayons over the price of crayons. Well, the marginal utility of crayons is the partial derivative of our utility function with respect to crayons. So as we found before in strategy number two, it's equal to two and the price is four. So the marginal utility per dollar spent on crayons is a half. Let's find that same ratio for pencils. So the marginal utility of pencils is going to be equal to the partial derivative of our utility function with respect to pencils. And we found before that that was equal to eight. The price of pencils is equal to four. So the marginal utility of pencils divided by the price of pencils is equal to four. So what you can see is that Monica gets more bang for her buck, more utility per dollar from pencils as we expect. And we get again in this third case, 
that corner solution that we found in the first two strategies as well, where Monica is, is consuming 400 pencils and no crayons. So that's really it. That's three ways to look at this case of perfect substitutes and how we might solve for the optimum bundle. We can either just simply calculate the level utility at our corner solutions and see which one is larger of either. We could compare the slopes of our indifference curves and our budget constraint, uh, or we could have a look at the marginal utility per dollar spent over each good. Okay, so I hope that that helped. Reach out if you have any trouble though. Thank you so much for watching my stuff. You can visit my website now, www.econhelp.com.au. So feel free to have a look. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well.